it's a uh, everything on Zoom tends to be super quiet. At least most of my experience, everyone's really quiet. So please feel free to speak up. Uh, if you put something in the chat box, I probably won't notice it because I'm not good at watching the chat box and talking at the same time. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about trapping particles and magnetogravitational traps and measuring them with uh, pulsed measurements, which is something that we've started doing recently. And I'll, I'll give the motivation for that uh, as we go along here. All right, let's see if my, there we go. Okay, so the motivation for our experiments are uh, doing tabletop gravitational measurements of a number of different kinds. One is looking at tests of macroscopic quantum mechanics, uh, is I think primarily what, what I'm here to talk about today. But also we're interested in doing precision measurements for example, of big G, which is, uh, in our case, it's a classical measurement. And high sensitivity force measurements, we're, we're thinking of other kinds of measurements we can do. Uh, why use levitated optomechanics for this? I think I don't really have to explain this to you guys. But um, in my point of view, cold atoms are, are a very beautiful thing. It's actually something that we'd like to have control of our particle that's, that's anywhere near what, what people can do with cold atoms. But really the weak point of them is that the gravitational forces on individual atoms are, are so small just because their masses are small. So we wanna take advantage of the much larger mass available in uh, levitated optomechanics. The other competitor is, is flexing systems like uh, micromechanical systems and nanomechanical systems. But uh, at least in principle, there's clamping losses in those systems that we in principle don't have to have in the levitated system. And another reason is that we can trap things that are basically spheres. And it's a, a really nice, simple geometry for doing measurements, particularly things like precision measurements, like a measurement of big G. Uh, as a physicist, it's, it's nice to, to work with simple spheres. So what's hard about these? Well, gravity is weak, of course, and the force of gravity between small things is, is even weaker. There's no way to shield against gravity. And as, as an experimenter, that's like a, a serious, serious issue. Uh, I've had to worry about the fact that uh, when students get out of the lecture hall that's across the hall from my lab and they walk through the hall, then the gravitational attraction of the students on my experiments is large enough to potentially cause an impact, which is kind of crazy, but um, something we've had to think about a little bit. And uh, there's also this funny thing, the weak equivalence principle that says that acceleration and gravity are basically indistinguishable. Uh, so we're actually sensitive to doing measurements in a non-inertial reference frame, which I'll, we actually take advantage of to measure vibrations. Uh, I'll show you that near the end of the talk. Uh, and we've had to worry things, worry about things like the fact that the Earth is rotating, and we've actually had to have the weird conversation in my lab of like which direction is the Earth's axis of rotation in our lab frame, and what impact does that have on our experiments? So there's funny things that you have to worry about uh, when doing these kinds of experiments. So uh, big G, uh, one of our motivations is to measure big G, the Newtonian constant of gravitation. It is the most poorly measured fundamental constant. And this is a plot of measurements of big G over the last few decades. And the, uh, the purple bar here in the middle is uh, the uh, 2018 codata value along with its uncertainty. And you can see that a lot of the measurements over time disagree with each other. Uh, they're really all over the place. And you're forced to come to the conclusion that either uh, the systematic errors have been really underestimated in these experiments, or big G is time dependent. And I think most of us probably think that uh, the real problem is, is that the systematic errors are really hard to, hard to estimate accurately in, in these systems. Uh, and by the way, this red data point over here with the large error bar is actually a cold atom based measurement. And so somewhat surprisingly, it's not, not that competitive with the other measurements here, which are really based on purely mechanical systems. Those are actually the, the leading measurements right now. Okay, so in terms of using levitated optomechanics in vacuum, which is the approach that we pursue, there's been a few uh, approaches that have been pursued. Obviously the leading one is optical trapping. There's a lot of groups by now who are working on this in many different geometries. And it's obviously been highly successful. The big disadvantage of it from my point of view is since you're using oscillating fields, uh, they're oscillating, of course, very quickly at optical frequencies, there is inevitably heating in the system. And uh, it would be nice to try to, to avoid that. Another com uh, competing system is to use uh, Paul traps or, or ion traps. Uh, here, you use a charged particle and an oscillating electric field. Uh, it, again, has some uh, nice features, but there's the disadvantage that you have to use 
uh, time dependent fields, oscillating fields. And so that introduces micro motion to the particle, which adds a lot of complexity. So we started out uh, a few years ago wanting to make a trap with completely static fields. And the only way to do that is with magnetic fields and using diamagnetic materials. And uh, now there's a number of other groups that have uh, started working on related traps at least. Uh, and, but we've stuck with our original one, which is this magnetogravitational trap. So diamagnetism is the only uh, route permitted by physics to make a static or to make a stable trap using only static fields. And that's because of Earnshaw's theorem, which you're probably all familiar with, that basically tells you you can't trap a particle in free space with any combination of fields like uh, electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields. Uh, if you ever pull up Earnshaw's original paper, it's, it's rather exotic. Uh, it's kind of fun. The, the theorem that, that has gotten his name here uh, is only one tiny little consequence of that, that paper. But diamagnetism is actually quantum mechanical, and Earnshaw's theorem really only applies to classical fields. And because of that, diamagnetism gets around Earnshaw's theorem and lets you make a stable trap uh, using only static fields. And of course, uh, some diamagnetic materials are easy to levitate, like superconductors. Uh, graphite is also not too hard, but uh, has a magnetic susceptibility that's a few orders of magnitude weaker than a superconductor. We don't use graphite in our experiments because it is electrically conductive. And because of that, if it moves in a magnetic field gradient, it has strong eddy currents induced in it and would be highly damped. And unfortunately, it is only uh, highly diamagnetic because of the delocalized uh, electrons, the, the sort of two-dimensional sheet of electrons um, that's in the material. And so to get rid of the conductivity, you'd also eliminate the diamagnetism. So almost all other materials out there are uh, much more weakly diamagnetic on the order of uh, susceptibilities on the order of 10 to minus five. And that includes things like uh, water and silica and diamonds and frogs and us. And uh, I guess uh, even if you weren't familiar with this field, you'd have to know this was a weak effect. Otherwise you could stick magnets on the bottom of your car and float above the roadway. That'd be pretty cool, but um, obviously not something we see a lot in daily life. So in order to make this a big effect, you either need to use very strong fields like that frog in the corner is levitating in an 18 Tesla field, or you need to make a very strong field gradient by making the field change over a short distance. And that's the route that we take is we make fields that are not too large. We make them with permanent magnets, but we make them change over a very short distance. So the fields we use are made from permanent magnets. Uh, we've used either neodymium iron boron magnets or samarium cobalt magnets. We like samarium cobalt for a purely practical reason, which is that it tolerates higher temperature and to get to ultra high vacuum, we need to bake our system. And um, this, the samarium cobalt can tolerate that. The geometry we use is a trap that looks basically like a linear quadrupole. Most of you, are, I think, are familiar with it. So uh, picture in the lower left corner here, the dark blue areas are the, um, the permanent magnets. And then we have four ferromagnetic pole pieces. They taper down to nearly a point to make a small gap where there's a strong field with a strong field gradient. So the field goes from approximately uh, one Tesla going in one direction to one Tesla in the opposite direction over a distance of about 100 microns. So uh, we have a field gradient of about a Tesla per 100 microns. This uh, pole piece arrangement forms a linear quadrupole that I have in cross section over here that has a magnetic field zero in the middle. So the particle, a trapped particle tends to get pushed towards the, the center of this region. But in the third dimension, in what we call the Z direction here, uh, the particle is unconfined by that linear quadrupole. And to make it confined in that third dimension, we break the vertical symmetry of the trap, making the top pole pieces shorter than the bottom ones. And that makes the low field region curve up as you leave the center of the trap. So the confinement of the particle in this third direction, in the Z direction, is actually due to gravity, due to the Earth's gravity holding the particle in. And that's why we call it a magnetogravitational trap. And just as a matter of notation, this will come up a few times, uh, this Z direction in the trap along the length of the quadrupole, we call the axial direction uh, because it's the axis of the quadrupole and it turns out that's nicely assigned to Z in a spherical harmonic expansion. The X direction uh, in this picture here, we call the transverse direction because it goes across the pole pieces. That's the direction that we illuminate the particle from and collect the light from. And then the y direction, which is just up and down, we call vertical. And it has to be up and down. That has to be in the direction of Earth's gravity. 
Okay, so uh, we've done some numerical calculations. These are somewhat old numerical calculations and we're actually doing much better ones now, uh, but these are still nice pictures. Uh, on the top left here, I have a cross section of the trap going through, looking down the linear quadrupole. You can see the low field region or zero field in the center of the trap. This is the field magnitude, magnetic field magnitude. If you look along the X direction, it's what we call the transverse direction that we image the particle from, you see that the low field region or the zero field region curves up as you exit the center of the trap. Uh, below, I have a simple spherical harmonic expansion of the trap, uh, trapping fields. This is the magnetic field magnitude. Uh, you again see that the particle can escape along the zero field region to the left and to the right in the z direction. Uh, if we just look at the magnetic field squared, it looks pretty similar. So this is the energy of the particle. Potential energy is proportional to the magnetic field squared. And when we include uh, Earth's gravity in the potential energy expansion, then we all of a sudden get a three-dimensional trap. And that's what you see here. So it's a, an elongated trap in the z direction. It's much weaker in that direction and uh, stronger in the other two directions. Uh, Brian, Brian, yeah. I, I missed something. I, I just missed that uh, Hawaii in the Z direction, you have the, the fields becoming stronger as you are going away from the electrodes. Ah, so this is not fields becoming stronger, but this is uh, the total potential energy. So this is magnetic plus gravitational potential energy. So this is the right, total right. trapping potential. So the particle uh, increases in, in potential energy in all directions. So it is a three-dimensional trap, but it is only trapped in the third dimension due to Earth's gravity. But, uh, Brian, if I may ask a yeah. uh, question. So the gravitational energy of what? Of the, of the system you're talking about or just... Uh... So this is uh, for a particle. Uh, so this is the, the gravitational potential energy of a particle in the trap. But since the gravitational energy comes per, is per unit volume, and the magnetic potential energy is also per unit volume, they can just be combined into sort of a, a total gravitational or a total potential that the particle exhibits. Of course, there's a ratio of magnetic susceptibility to density of the particle that matters to set the, the importance of- The free fall kind of, um, you're not in a free fall system here. Not in a free fall system, no. no. We've thought about it, but uh, no. Uh, experimentally, it's much easier to just have something that, that stays trapped, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to show you a little bit more of what this looks like, I have a uh, few fun images. On the left here, this is a movie that we took when we were really first designing these traps. Uh, it's one of these traps uh, and it's on its back. So gravity is not pointing in the right direction. So particles don't get trapped in there. So that's why you see these little droplets that are, I think are isopropanol getting sprayed into the trap and they don't stay in there for very long. This is also in air. So there's air currents that push the particles around. Uh, but it shows you that uh, these drops of liquid are, are somewhat trapped in there. At least they, they tend to get trapped in two dimensions. They fall out in the third direction because gravity is facing the wrong way. But uh, what, I, what I like about this is if you take this movie and combine all of the frames together, you can get the image that I show on the right here, which shows where the particles have hung out in this movie. And you can see that they hang out exactly in that trapping region as I described. You can even see that it curves up a little bit as you go to the left and right. So that curvature is actually very weak. Right? The trap is actually quite flat in this Z direction. It's just a very slight curvature that creates the restoring force. Uh, so I thought that's neat that you can see the, the trap shape there. All right, so this is experimentally what we actually, what our system actually looks like. In the upper left, you can see the quadrupole arrangement of the magnets. This is the, there's a samarium cobalt magnet up here and down here. These four pole pieces are made out of uh, Hyperco 50. It's an iron cobalt alloy that has the highest uh, saturation magnetization of any commercially produced alloy. It's a little hard to machine, but we still tend to like it. Uh, and the particle gets trapped right there in between the four pole pieces. There's a little tiny gap. Uh, and these traps are assembled by hand quite painfully. So my grad students don't like to rip these traps apart and rebuild them very often because it's, it's a little bit of, a little bit tedious to get all the gaps right. The trap itself is inside of this vacuum chamber over here. Uh, it's about the size of, of a cantaloupe, I would say. So bigger than a grapefruit. Um, those are, uh, those uh, conflat flanges here are a little more than hundred millimeters across. And it's an ultra high vacuum chamber. You can see the heater tape wrapped all around it. There's vacuum pumps all around it. Uh, there's a, a disconnected hose over here that would normally go to a rough pump and a turbo pump. We disconnect them once we get to high vacuum or once we get to ultra high vacuum because the turbo pump adds too much vibration to the system. So we don't like to use any mechanical pumps. Once we have pumped it out, uh, 
to high vacuum and baked it for about a day at 150 degrees C, we turn on an ion pump, which is hiding back here. You can see the black part of the magnet on it back here. Uh, that ion pump then gets us down to the rest of the way to ultra high vacuum, along with the titanium sublimation pump, which is uh, the sort of gold colored can right over here. And those two together can uh, keep the chamber at around 10 to the minus 10 tor or so uh, for essentially as long as we want. We uh, don't know our vacuum very precisely because we find that ion gauges, which is really the only practical way to measure the pressure at, uh, at these ultra high vacuum levels, uh, ion gauges produce too many ions uh, and tend to knock the particle out when they're turned on. So they produce this sort of little rush of, of ions when the filament turns on. And so we don't use an ion gauge on the system at all. We can use the ion pump to estimate uh, the vacuum. And that's what we do uh, along with the hold time that it has from the titanium sublimation pump before we need to refire the titanium sublimation pump. Uh, those together tell us that the, the pressure is less than 10 to the minus 10 torr. Uh, you also see some of the custom optics here. This black cylinder is a custom built microscope objective that is used to collect the light that scatters off the particle. So that's our, our little vacuum chamber there. Oh, and this is, by the way, in the lower left, the view through the front of the chamber uh, through the collection, uh, where the collection optics would see. You can see the trap and little tiny gap where the particle would live. Okay, so the particle has to be loaded at atmospheric pressure, uh, even though we ultimately get to ultra high vacuum, which means that if someone comes along and bangs into our optical table, it can knock the particle out. We have to start all over again at atmospheric pressure. So that's a little bit painful. Uh, the good news is that once we get a particle trapped, it can usually stay trapped in there for months. And I think we even had one trapped for almost a year at one point. Uh, it's usually limited by someone banging into the table or just wanting to change something. The typical particles we use are solid silica microspheres. Uh, we've also used silicon carbide, which I'll get to talking about at the end because it can contain defects. But most of the time we just use these commercially available silicon microspheres because they're cheap, but we can get them in any size we want, basically. Uh, we load them just by spraying them in dry at atmospheric pressure. Uh, it doesn't really matter because we only need to trap one. We don't need to do it too often. And the typical size we use is around one to one and a half microns. And that was chosen so that the scattered light off the particle just fills the collection optics. Um, with wavelength, uh, a wavelength of illumination of around 800 nanometers. We've gone up to 852 nanometers, and now we're actually switching to 785 nanometers for uh, reasons of detector efficiency. But roughly speaking, the light scatters pretty well into a 0.5 Na objective. We also can't go a whole lot smaller because the thermal energy of the particle gets to be too large and they tend to jump out of the trap uh, when they're at atmospheric pressure. Once we have them under vacuum and we can feedback cool them, it's not a problem. But uh, at atmospheric pressure, they, uh, they jump around quite a bit. And if they're too much smaller than a micron, then they just get really hard to keep in the trap. They get lost too easily. Okay, and we can detect the motion of the particle by collecting light that we scatter off the particle, which you see in the upper right image here. Uh, it looks like just a spot. It's basically just a diffraction limited spot because of the design of our optics. Uh, that's collecting only the scattered light. If we change the geometry a bit, we can collect the incident and scattered light. And then we start to see these rings uh, of interference between the incident and scattered light. And I'll come back to that at the end. Um, we're, we're looking at actually detecting the, the particle's position holographically now, which would be pretty cool, I think. OK, hold on. I think I missed a slide. What did it? Where did it go? Hold on a second. Ah, I accidentally hit it. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a, a summary of things that um, most of you have already seen that we know how to do with these traps. So I just wanted to go through it uh, fairly quickly. So as I said, we trap particles from about one to 65 microns in diameter. The oscillation frequencies in our trap are really low. They're from, they go from about a 10th of a Hertz in the axial direction up to about 10 Hertz in the axial direction. We, if we can make it really low, if we try to, the highest we can make it is a little over 10 Hertz in that, that Z direction or axial direction. The other two oscillation frequencies tend to be about 50 to 120 Hertz. Uh, we try to avoid power line frequency, which is 60 Hertz here in the US. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes this uh, transverse frequency tends to get very close to it. We trap an ultra high vacuum, as I've said, about 10 to minus 10 tor. And we can, uh, as with a number of other experimental groups, we can do perfect neutralization of our particle by adding or subtracting a single electron at a time from the particle and uh, watching its response to a magnetic field, so, or to an electric field, oscillating electric field. And uh, we can then tell when we have it perfectly neutralized, 
that gets rid of any electric monopole moment, but not any electric dipole moment, of course. We can then do feedback cooling. We do uh, linear feedback cooling. That is, we just image the particle onto a detector, typically a quadrant detector, although we now use other detectors. We take the time derivative of that signal to get the velocity of the particle, and we feedback a force, which is just proportional to the velocity of the particle. Of course, it should have a negative sign. And most of the time these days, we apply that force by a second laser that scatters off the particle at, an, at a funny angle. And we use uh, the radiation pressure of that uh, laser scattered off the particle to give the particle a push. Uh, in practice, we now have a much more complicated optic system than this. This is the, the cartoon version. We actually use five control beams, not just one, and a, a host of different detectors and stabilized lasers and things. Interestingly, we've also done feedback using uh, either magnetic fields, that's not too hard to do with a current carrying wire, or even we've done feedback by shaking the table, the optical table that the experiment is on and, and cooled the motion that way. It works, it's not as easy to control as the optics. So in practice, uh, the optics is what we, optical cooling uh, with this control laser is what we usually like to do. And we've reached temperatures of about 140 microkelvin in the axial direction. So uh, not quite as well in the vertical and transverse direction uh, for reasons that, that we don't entirely understand, I would say, why the axial direction, which is the lowest frequency direction, actually works the best in some ways. Okay, so I, mean, I already talked about that. Uh, here's some data from a whole collection of particles. This was from uh, a grad student and then postdoc that I had, and I had him collect all of his data over all the years that he worked in my lab and plot them all together and, and show how well we can do essentially in cooling as a function of pressure in the system. So this is pressure on the horizontal axis, obviously on a log scale. Uh, and then instead of plotting temperature, I plotted the damping, the inferred damping, based on how well we can cool the particle. And what we see is over a wide range of particles and these different shapes or different materials of particles or different sizes, uh, that of course the cooling improves as we uh, decrease the pressure. This blue line is actually what we calculated the damping should be from the residual gas. We see that the damping improves, gets better and better, but then it seems to flatten out at some point. We stop getting improvements at the lowest pressures. And in the vertical, so this is the axial direction. In the vertical direction, we see even more so that it levels off much earlier and stops improving with pressure. So this tells us that there is either some kind of noise mechanism in the system that we're not controlling well or some kind of damping mechanism. And we actually strongly suspect that it's damping. And uh, the mechanism that we think is limiting us right now is that the uh, trapped particle has a magnetic moment to it, of course, that's, that's induced by the external field. And that magnetic moment then when it moves creates changing magnetic fields in the pole pieces, which creates eddy currents, which add damping. So we think that we are probably limited by eddy current damping in the pole pieces. And there's a couple of things that we're looking at to try to get around that. Uh, one is to try to lift the particle up into a region where the magnetic field is much weaker. We don't, we tend to let it sit down, it's biased down due to gravity. So it's actually not really at the zero in the magnetic field. If we pull it up so that it's closer to that zero, we could get rid of the, the magnetic dipole moment and only have a magnetic quadrupole moment. Uh, another possibility that we're looking at is using a different material for pole pieces that is less electrically conductive. Unfortunately, the combination of high magnetic susceptibility uh, and high saturation magnetization doesn't, and and low electrical conductivity doesn't tend to exist very easily, but there are a few materials out there that can potentially be used that we're looking at. So that's what we would need to do to, to get lower damping really and less thermal noise in the system. But in any case, we're still really far from the quantum ground state. We have uh, an occupation number of something like 10 to the five. And we're probably limited by a number of things, probably not vacuum right now, possibly noise. We've looked at vibration. It doesn't seem to be quite our leading order noise source. Uh, this eddy current damping is likely a, a leading source. We've worried about some uh, sources of noise due to rotation that I'll get back to in a few minutes. Um, so you could say, well, all right, this doesn't mean that you're doomed, these noise sources. You could just increase the optical power that you scatter off the particle so that you're basically doing faster measurements and making the radiation pressure shot noise on the particle dominate in order to get closer to the standard quantum limit and potentially closer to the ground state. The, the problem is that if you look at the data we have so far, the quantum decoherence time of the system of the, of the motion of the particle is less than one oscillation period. So what that means is if you tried to cool it, cool it faster and faster, 
uh, to get to the ground state, you really get to the point where you have an overdamped harmonic oscillator very quickly. And once you have an overdamped harmonic oscillator, uh, you're not going to cool to the to the ground state or to the normal ground state of the weakly damped harmonic oscillator. So we decided to try to do to go in a slightly different direction, and that is to make pulsed measurements, where we do measurements on a time scale that is short compared to the oscillation period. And in that case, we can start to think of the particle not as a harmonic oscillator, but just as a free particle. And uh, so this is a direction we've been pursuing. And there's actually a second motivation for it, which is that if we can do things on shorter time scales, then we start to get closer to reasonable time scales for um, defect states in some materials like diamond or in our case, silicon carbide. So uh, it becomes a more interesting time scale for, for those defects as well. So we can do a quick noise analysis. This is not going to be anything too, too surprising for most of you uh, of noise sources in this kind of short time. So this is now these pulse measurements. We're doing everything short time compared to the uh, oscillation period. So we're analyzing everything as a free particle. So if we scatter n lambda photons off the particle, the particle gets a momentum kick given by this formula here. Um, there's a one funny parameter in here, uh, which is this FZ, which describes the geometry of the kick. Then you can calculate the, uh, the minimum uh, possible uncertainty from the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship for the position and use this, can use this relationship here. Okay, that's just putting a limit on, on delta P delta Z. Uh, this isn't super accurate, but it gives a starting point. I'll, I'll show you a slightly more accurate version of it next. Uh, so that's detected shot noise in our detector. So this is a sort of the limit of how well we could possibly do. And uh, then the third noise source in our system is thermal noise. And it turns out that if you do a quick analysis of thermal noise, you realize that the thermal displacement of the particle is much bigger than the standard quantum limit on any practical time scale. But if you make a sequence of position measurements, like at least two, so you're really then measuring the thermal velocity or the velocity of the particle, or a series of three position measurements where you're really measuring the acceleration of the particle, uh, then you can actually make the thermal noise much less important. And uh, so in that case, a series of three position measurements that are arranged to look like a discrete measurement of the acceleration, uh, we can calculate what the um, thermal noise should be from that with a finite temperature uh, that, that we can put in. And there is an extra funny parameter in there up front, which we have to calculate numerically, um, but it's of order one. So if we put all of these things these three noise sources together in the three measurement sequence now quite specifically, and add in a few more parameters that have to be calculated numerically. This is what our total noise looks like in our system. Um, and there's a few parameters in here, as I said, there's a, a geometry factor, which is this FZ that I put in at the beginning. We can calculate it from me scattering. We can calculate things like the uh, collection efficiency of our system uh, from again, me scattering and uh, also some Fourier optics. We can calculate some efficiencies from that that go into here. We end up putting in a collection efficiency as well as a, um, an information uh, collection efficiency effectively. And then there's a thermal force factor that we can calculate and put in. These are all just numerical things that are calculated. And uh, we can put those together to get what we think is a pretty accurate um, model of how the measurements should behave. Okay, and that's what I've got here. So this upper plot here, is now showing the uncertainty in Z, but it's the uncertainty in this three position measurement as a function of the detected power scattered off the particles. This is not the total power scattered off the particle, but just the portion of it that, that we detect. And if all of our efficiencies were perfect, then we should get this green curve here for uh, uncertainty in position as a function of power. If we put in real parameters of our system, including all of our numerical calculations, then the limit that we get is this orange curve here. Uh, it's actually less than an order of magnitude worse than the, the perfect efficiency case, which seems pretty good. However, our real measurements look like these blue dots up here right now. That's, that's how well we're actually doing, which is obviously not that great. So uh, when we try to analyze what's going on here, uh, we have carefully analyzed and, and uh, characterized all of our detectors and electronics. We had to build new detectors and new digitizers, analog to digital and digital to analog converters for all of this. Uh, these curves down here characterize that. And what these basically show is that uh, our detector is behaving the way we expect. It is shot noise limited uh, over a good chunk of the power range. It has some dark noise at lower powers, but where that occurs is by design. 
Um, our analog to digital and digital to analog converters are quiet compared to our detector. Those are these purple dots here. So everything actually looks pretty good. The blue dots are on here from the experimental measurement of the particle behavior. And what we see is actually at low powers, uh, it seems like we are getting shot noise, or actually this is detector dark noise limited measurements, but uh, at high power, um, we are not, something else is going on. And even at low power, we don't seem to be anywhere near the, the shot noise limit that we predicted in terms of position uncertainty. This bottom plot is in terms of actual detected signals like voltages. Um, so there's a couple of funny things going on that we had to think about here for a while. And we have, we have some ideas of, of what's going on. So the first thing that's going on, uh, which is a purely experimental problem, is that the spot size that we're getting uh, from our particle from the scattered light imaged onto our detector is much larger than what we're calculating, much larger than the diffraction limit. And down in the lower plot here, uh, you can see the blue curve is my calculated spot, what it should look like on a detector or on a camera. And the blue and orange curves are cross sections through the spot that we're actually getting. Uh, they're two to three times broader than they should be based on the diffraction limit, even doing it carefully using uh, me scattering and Fourier optics and all of that. And uh, so what we've determined is that there are some aberrations in our collection optics. This is mostly, we think, due to alignment in the, the homemade objective that we use, uh, which has uh, three lenses combined together that really should be precisely aligned to each other, and they're, they're not that precisely aligned yet. The second problem is actually far more subtle, which is uh, an assumption that we started off making that turns out to be incorrect, which is we kind of assume that our particles are spheres, um, they're, I think, around 99% spherical or 98% spherical, according to the manufacturer. Uh, but that a residual aspherosity, that is, they're slightly ellipsoidal, is actually a problem. And it causes two problems. One is that the when the light scatters off this ellipsoid, it is slightly biased in one direction, depending upon the orientation of the particle. And the particle is randomly rotating. And when you include this bias in the scattering direction, with the aberrations in the optics, even if they were mostly diffraction limited, uh, it, the change in direction of scattering turns into a change in apparent position of the particle, uh, which is a real, ser really serious problem. Um, even in a diffraction limited system, unless the optics are perfect, you'll get some of this effect. The other is that if the scattering direction is fluctuating somewhat due to the rotation of the particle, then uh, at high power, we're going to see radiation pressure on the particle, which is varying depending upon the direction of the particle. And instead of just having shot noise pushing the particle around, we're going to have this variation in scattering direction pushing the particle around. So that's what we think is going on at high power. Uh, so we have to learn to deal with both of these things, I think. Um, there, there's a handful of possible ways of, of managing it. Um, one thing we're doing, this is a, a diagram of the optics in our microscope objective. Uh, we are adding lots of adjustments to try to minimize aberrations in, uh, in the optics. And that ends up making a 15 dimensional parameter space to optimize the position of each of the lenses over. Um, and so I'm getting an undergrad to work on this. We'll, we'll see how he does. Uh, it's kind of a, I think going to be a tedious problem, but we're hoping to get some improvements. The other thing we're trying to do to get a better handle on what the particle is doing is holographic imaging of the particle. And the idea here is to uh, allow there to be some interference between the collected, the, the scattered light and the incident light uh, from the particle. And with that, it turns out that you can make a really a three-dimensional uh, image of what the particle looks like, including uh, to some extent aspherosity and orientation of, of the ellipsoid. And you can also gather data in such a way that you can numerically correct for uh, aberrations in the optics as well. So this is something that is computationally very intensive to, to gather data this way and then to analyze it. But um, as long as we're doing the analysis of the data offline that is not in real time, uh, it should be perfectly fine. So we're looking at a few, few possible uses for that, um, including just determining sometimes if the particle is at an unfavorable angle, if the orientation is unfavorable, is too asymmetric uh, for the measurement that you might just skip that measurement. The other thing you could imagine doing that I didn't write down on here is spinning up the particle to a high speed. And we've actually done that. Uh, if you use circularly polarized light, you can spin up the particle and try to average out uh, the uh, ellipsoidal shape of the particle. But in practice, that creates new problems because you end up with uh, precession of the rotation. 
and funny effects due to the Earth's rotation and strange things like that that we haven't really gotten a great handle on. So we, we haven't become big fans of, of spinning up the particle yet, but that, that is a possible direction to go in the future. You could also imagine starting with a very intentionally elongated particle that's not at all circular so that you can control the rotation. But of course, if it's just like a cigar shaped particle, a long thin one, it can still rotate along its long axis. Uh, so if you really wanna control all degrees of rotation, you probably have to have a sort of uh, like triangular shaped particle or something like that. And that, that is not trivial then to figure out what it's doing and control it or, or to make it. So we haven't gone in that direction yet. So that, that's the, the end of what I'm gonna talk about in terms of pulsed measurements. We have for a while thought about using our particles as a force sensor because they should be really sensitive. And if you use the standard formula for calculating the sensitivity of a, of a damped harmonic oscillator at finite temperature, uh, we actually do pretty well compared to optical trapping measurements with a sensitivity that's estimated to be around 10 to the minus 20 Newtons per root Hertz in one of these, these particles. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, we haven't yet really used it to measure forces, but we're looking at using it to measure the uh, Newtonian constant of gravitation. And this is a purely classical measurement. So I'll go through it a little bit quickly, but it introduces some neat technology. So the basic idea is if you measure the oscillation frequency of the particle, uh, in our case, we're looking at using the axial oscillation that's side to side. This, this little M on a spring is meant to represent our, our particle in the trap. If you measure its oscillation frequency, and then you bring two big, we call field masses nearby that create a gravitational field, it will change the oscillation frequency uh, of the particle a little bit, depending upon their geometry and mass. And if you know the oscillation frequency of the particle before those masses are brought there, and then measure it again after they're brought there, it turns out you can quite easily calculate big G. There's a very simple dependence. And you don't have to know the mass of the trapped particle, which is something that we can't measure precisely. The, the hard part about it is that you have to measure a very small change in the oscillation frequency. And you have to start with a very low oscillation frequency to make it significant. You need a very weak spring constant uh, in order to make these gravitational forces to be at all significant. Okay, so the way we do that uh, is with trapping a, a large particle in this case. So this is why it's classical is this is a 60 micron sphere that's trapped uh, in this trap. This is, we have long pole pieces as well in this experiment. Uh, here's our optics diagram. It's actually very simple in this experiment. We scatter uh, light off the particle. Here we like to use an LED instead of a laser so that we don't get too many weird uh, coherence effects in the light. So this, that's why we get such a simple image here. We collect the scattered light and image it onto a camera. And we again have feedback cooling, but we now do it purely with camera. Uh, and a second laser that we actually would turn off during the real experiment. The, the laser, this control laser is just used to prepare uh, the state of the particle. So I actually had a grad student working on this who had been in my lab for, for several years and it was about time for him to graduate. So I thought, well, we're not gonna get a big G measurement done before he graduates. So I needed something simpler uh, to get him to have something to write up. And so um, we thought about, um, doing some acceleration measurements. So let me actually, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. The way we detect the position um, of the particle moving around in this trap is actually kind of neat. So we take a, just a series of images and uh, basically a movie of the particle. And then we want to see how much the particle has moved from one image to the other. And we do that by cross correlating the images in the Fourier domain. And we've learned uh, with some collaborators of ours at West Virginia University, uh, we've learned some tricks on how to do this cross correlation very carefully uh, so that we can get really remarkable precision of uh, about 1.6 nanometers of resolution per image. So looking at the displacement from one image to the next and the pixel size in the image is about one micron. So we're actually able to measure displacements of the particle that are about a thousandth of a pixel. And one of the tricks for doing that is that when we cross correlate the images, uh, we don't just cross correlate them against a, a simple frame. So you might choose like the first picture and cross correlate all of them against that. But it turns out then that noise in that first picture and slight variations in the image um, from image to image uh, create uh, some extra noise in the system, which is actually these, these gold triangles in the upper right here, which are showing the position of the particle as a function of time. So instead what we do is we, we do this simple procedure of cross correlating once against the first image and then we take all of the images, which can be a lot because this can be 24 hours worth of data sampled at, at 100 Hertz. Um, we take all the images and shift them so that they're on top of each other really in the Fourier domain. 
and uh, then average them all. And then we recross correlate against that averaged image. And then we can repeat this process of shifting all the images on top of each other and making a new sort of canonical image to cross correlate against. We call that image the eigenframe. Uh, as many times as we want, we find after a few iterations, everything converges and we can get to a really nice smooth uh, trajectory of the particle like this. And that gives us that uh, 1.6 nanometers of noise per image. And I'll tell you a little bit more about where that comes from in a minute, how we know that number. So we then use this in order to get the student something to graduate with. We used it to do acceleration sense sensing, although it turned out to be interesting in itself. And so what we did is we measured the apparent acceleration of the particle as a function of frequency from, um, this is from a few minutes of data. And that's this curve that's in gold here. There's frequency going from zero up to 20 Hertz. We're on a, a log scale vertically. And this is, as I said, the acceleration of the particle. In blue, I have the acceleration of the test masses in a commercial geophone or seismometer. And this happens to be exactly the same seismometer that LIGO uses. And so they've characterized it very well. That's why we, we chose it. Uh, and it has one kilogram masses inside suspended by springs. And that's this blue curve. And you can see, okay, the two curves don't really lie on top of each other. And that's because this is just the acceleration of the particle or of the masses in the geophone. Uh, but the particle and the geophone both really are harmonic oscillators and they both have a resonance in them. This is the particle resonance here, this high peak, it's at uh, uh, around two Hertz. And it turns out that the seismometer has a resonance at around the same frequency. So they're not quite uh, on top of each other. We really have to factor out the re harmonic oscillator responses. So if we do that, things get much better. Now, in order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about our particle. We need to measure its oscillation frequency and its damping. This is its damping with feedback on. And we can get this ring down of our particle that you see here. We can fit this to get the, the damping rate as well as the frequency. We can use that to remove the harmonic oscillator response from our, our particle accelerometer. And the, the manufacturer of the seismometer gives us a similar calibration of frequency and damping for that seismometer. We can't recalibrate it, we have to trust them. And when we use these, plot these two with the harmonic oscillator response removed and actually apply a test drive, we shake our whole optical table at around five Hertz. Um, we can see that the response of the two systems matched within 3%. So we actually made a really nice uh, accelerometer or seismometer out of our particle here. Uh, interestingly, the spectra that you see here in this plot are on our optical table, even with it floating on air. So this is, even with vibration isolation, this is the, the vibrations that are left on our optical table. They're still quite easily measured uh, on our particle, at least for this, this large particle that we have trapped here. So we thought that was kind of a, a neat trick uh, that we can do this image analysis to get this kind of very uh, accurate uh, accelerometer. Uh, and this is a noise analysis of the system. The solid lines here, here's our data. It's over a little wider frequency range. The solid lines are um, the, the noise analysis of the commercial instrument. And this is really just off of the LIGO analysis. And the dashed lines are the noise associated with our particle as a, an accelerometer. Uh, and over most of the frequency range is actually limited by readout noise. That's this, this curve that goes up. Um, and that's that 1.6 nanometers per image turns out to limit uh, how well we can do here primarily. At low frequencies, we start getting limited by what we think is thermal noise. Uh, that's this purple dashed line, which is, this is nowhere near as quiet thermally as our small particles, uh, mostly because we have to do our feedback off of images and we're actually computationally limited how fast our computers are in order, order to do that feedback accurately in this system. Uh, we might be able to beat the commercial seismometer in a small frequency range at low frequencies, basically right on resonance, but uh, we haven't really tried to explore that yet. I think the cool thing is in the end, we're doing uh, almost as well as the commercial seismometer in, for real practical data uh, with a mass that's about 10 to the nine times smaller. So this is all neat, but probably the most useful thing for, for most of your interest is that um, we can actually take larger particles and track their position pretty accurately using this kind of image analysis. And it turns out we're not too far from the shot noise limit, even for tracking these large particles. So I think that's kind of interesting. It hasn't yet led us to go, led us to go towards larger particles than the one micron particles for quantum experiments, but it's at least something we've thought about a little bit. The big problem is that the power would have to be much, much higher uh, in order to get any kind of uh, back action uh, limit on the particles, on the big particles. Okay, so I wanted to save a few minutes to talk about uh, trapping silicon carbide that has active defects in it. So 
This is basically the same idea of trapping a diamond with NV centers in it. But instead of diamond, we switched to using silicon carbide, which has a number of different defects in it that uh, have spins associated with them and are, are at least interesting. The reason for switching to silicon carbide is that we found it really hard to find good quality diamond and um, especially small diamond particles that are of any decent quality. And they tended to get, the, the low quality diamonds tend to have a lot of graphite in them and they heat up very easily and that causes lots of problems. And silicon carbide is a commercially produced semiconductor. And so it's produced in, in decently high purity and it's much more easily available, at least if you, if you know some people uh, in the industry, uh, much more easily available than diamond at, at high quality. And so I happen to have a collaborator who is uh, very much involved in silicon carbide. He's been able to give us material and get a, give us lots of advice on using silicon carbide. There, there's two things that we are interested in doing with these defects in trapped particles. One is to sense the magnetic field at the particle location. This can, this can give you both information about the trap, which we need to know for our big G experiments, and also the orientation, that is the rotation of the particle. You can get some information about that as well, which is interesting. And the other thing, which is of course what you want for, for making uh, interesting macroscopic superposition states is to apply a spin state dependent force on the particle. So we're, we're looking at doing both of those things. Um, so let me, here's a little bit more about this defect state. Uh, it has emission in the near infrared. It's at around 900 nanometers. It's not quite as convenient in some ways as the silicon vacancy center, um, but it's not too horrible. Uh, it's it's an, a little bit easier defect to make than nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond because the silicon vacancy center only requires a missing silicon atom. You don't have to get a, a dopant in there. Um, it's a spin three halves state uh, or defect, um, which actually gives it some interesting properties that I'm not really going to go into. The big disadvantage of it is in terms of doing optically detected magnetic resonance where you look at the photoluminescence of the defect as an indicator of the spin state, the contrast in the photoluminescence is much, much smaller uh, in the silicon vacancy center than in the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. In diamond, it can be on the order of 10% uh, uh, contrast in photoluminescence, and in the silicon vacancy center, it is less than 1%. So it's actually fairly hard to read out the spin state optically. So far, the coherence times for uh, these defects seem to be a little bit lower than in diamond uh, at room temperature, but not necessarily enormously lower. Uh, they're on the order of 100 microseconds. And that matches with the time scales of the pulsed measurements we're trying to do. They are also on the order of 100 microseconds or a few hundred microseconds. And that, that is certainly somewhat by, by design. Okay, so, uh, so far we have been able to trap these particles we have been able to uh, do uh, ODMR, optically detected magnetic resonance on the spins outside of the trap. We've been able to see photoluminescence inside the trap, but we're not yet to the point of doing spin resonance inside the trap. That is the next thing we're going to do. And hopefully uh, we're going to be really making a lot of progress on that over the next six months. That's, that's my hope. So what do we really want to do with these things? Well. Uh, as I said, we, we already know how to trap silicon carbide particles with these silicon vacancy centers. They actually trap very easily. And there's two approaches for doing ESR in these particles. And one of these is pretty interesting. One is ODMR. This is the standard one. You collect a spin-dependent photoluminescence. Um, as I said, it has low contrast in this material. And there are other challenges like uh, collecting all these different scattered or emitted light at different wavelengths and things like that. But we actually have another uh, approach that we want to try, which looks like it could work but we haven't demonstrated it yet. And that is to try to flip the spin. So let's say, let's think of it as a spin with half state because it's easier to think that way. Flip the spin up and down uh, at the vertical resonance frequency of the particle in the trap. So we're flipping the spin at the mechanical resonance frequency of the system. And as it flips up and down or side to side, because actually here's our picture of a cartoon of a, my spin one half particle in our trap bias down due to gravity you flip the spin uh, back and forth due to the vertical gradient of the magnetic field that will apply then an oscillating force on the particle up and down. And now we can use our force sensitivity of, uh, of our detection, which is pretty good uh, to essentially see the particle wiggle up and down a little bit when we get the microwaves on resonance to flip the spin 
at the at the right rate. And I'm not, this is not like a Robbie oscillation of the spin or something like that. This is at least at first going to be something very simple. We'll keep resetting the spin optically. You can you can do that in this system just like in NV centers. And and while uh, using microwaves to flip the spin uh, repeatedly. But everything here is so slow, the vertical frequency is so slow that that's quite easy to do. So uh, we call this um, at the moment mechanically resonant stern gerlach detection because it looks kind of like the stern gerlach effect, but it's an AC version of the stern gerlach effect where we make the particle oscillate. Um, so that is something that we're going to try to do fairly soon. Uh, if we can get this to work, then we can start mapping out the magnetic field uh, using this ESR. We can measure out the rotation of trapped particles with ESR. And then, of course, what we really want to do, this is our, our, our kind of stretch goal, like a lot of other groups, is to start making spin superposition states uh, once we can get a good handle on ESR uh, in the trap uh, and then get those to convert to, to mechanical superposition states, as spatial superposition states, and then look at making interferometer and all of that. Now, in practice, with the field gradients that we have in the trap, which are on the order of a Tesla per 100 microns, and with the time scale of 100 microns, uh, 100 microseconds uh, for the coherence time of these centers in our particles, the size scale of this superposition state is going to be very tiny on the order of picometers. And uh, so we're going to have to even fight to get it to be large enough to be something we can detect even once we're able to do all of our measurements at the standard quantum limit. So we're really just, I would say, starting to tickle the edge of the parameter range where this could be interesting if we can get it to work. Beyond that, we have to get to longer coherence times or stronger field gradients or both. Uh, longer coherence times could come in a cryogenic system. Uh, these particles certainly, or these defects can certainly have longer coherence times if we can keep the particle cold, but that's tricky when you're scattering light off of it and all of that. Um, and stronger magnetic field gradients are certainly possible but um, tricky to work with and just add a lot of experimental difficulty. So those are directions that I think we can try to go in once we start to get some, some success, get some of these other, um, other challenges out of the way, I'd say. Okay, so here's uh, just a quick summary of some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, we're approaching these high speed shot noise limited measurements um, and uh, ideally at the standard quantum limit. And this is for small particles. These are sort of micron scale particles. For large particles, we do this image-based displacement, and uh, we can detect to about a thousandth of a pixel, which ends up being about a nanometer or so per, per image, uh, really at quite low light level. So this is actually pretty neat. Um, the things that are challenges are that we need diffraction-limited optics, and they actually need to be better than just the typical standard for diffraction-limited in order to do quantum-limited detection and avoid uh, problems due to things like aspherical particles and rotation which can create both uh, apparent excess noise and excess radiation pressure noise on the particle. And uh, to deal with these, other than fixing our optics, which is an obvious thing to try to do, uh, we're looking at trying to do this kind of holographic detection of the particle's motion, which um, I think is a really neat option. I haven't done a complete theoretical analysis of it yet, um, but it looks like it's, it's quite plausible to do. And we're hoping to start getting some results in that direction uh, pretty soon. Okay, so usual uh, acknowledgements here. I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, collaborators at West Virginia University, uh, Zach Etienne and his group, who did all of the image analysis um, for those vibration measurements. Uh, those all had to be done on a supercomputer because that, that turns out to be quite computationally intensive. Um, and then I have uh, an assortment of uh, grad students, lots of undergrads uh, who have worked on all of this. And um, uh, and we're always looking for new students. So if anybody has uh, students who, who would like to study in Montana, uh, it's a beautiful place. Um, just feel free to give them my contact info and, uh, and have them contact me. All right, thanks. Uh, it's time for questions, I, I hope, I think. Brian, thank you very much. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a very, very, really, really very interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so so maybe people will have some questions uh, and, and we start with the, some of the, the questions from various people. Yeah, so Gavin, Gavin, please go ahead. Uh, hey, Brian. Hi. That was awesome. That's great. Thanks. Lots of interesting stuff there. Um, you mentioned uh, wanting to have a higher magnetic field gradient. So, I mean, um, 
I'd be interested to know what you know how you're thinking about doing that. Are you thinking about having trapped flux in a um, in a superconductor? Because you've seen there's these crazy experiments that have demonstrated like 17 tesla in the in the in the superconductor. Would you uh, would you take that on? You know, I, I think it's a possibility. We we do have one cryogenic system in my lab um, that has a pulse tube that we can cool down a trap to cryogenic temperatures to 4K at least. Um, I don't want to go colder than that because it's too painful. But but I have to say, when I got out of grad school, so I worked with a dilution refrigerator in grad school, and when I graduated, I promised myself that I would never do another trapping experiment and I would never do another cryogenic experiment. And I would never use another dilution refrigerator. And I've broken two out of three of those promises so far. Uh, I do a little bit of cryogenics, not a whole lot, but I still, I, I really try to avoid it because it, you know, it, it just takes so much more time. Um, I, I think, uh, but I think realistically a superconductor, some kind of superconducting system is the only way to get real substantial increases on that. We could potentially squish our trap down a little bit and maybe gain a little bit more, but not a whole lot more realistically. Um, so I, I think, yeah, something like that is what we'd have to do. Cool. Thanks. Can I make the comment? Sure. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the for the very interesting talk. Uh, yes, my comment is that if uh, uh, because if I understand correctly, the the uh, this vibration and instability of the particle is uh, at least partially thermal. Therefore, by, by decreasing temperature, probably you can. Uh, make it less moving, especially with this uh, uh, problem of uh, non-sphericality of, of the particles. Huh? I don't know if I am correct or not. Huh? Yeah, no, I think that's right. So if, well, so it depends. If the, the limit is really due to uh, eddy current damping of the particle, eddy currents in the pole pieces, then cooling down the pole pieces should of course decrease the temperature that you get to. It should decrease that noise source. Um, in practice, we haven't, uh, put that much effort into doing that because it's hard and it's a lot of work to gain what is just two orders of magnitude, right? I mean, okay, that doesn't sound that bad, but uh, we've already, we've cooled down six orders of magnitude below, you know, ambient temperature using just these feedback techniques. And if we can avoid using cryogenics, we, we will. Um, ultimately, if you wanted any real hope of getting down to the quantum ground state, you'd have to go cryogenic anyway because otherwise black body photons from the room temperature trap are, are too significant. They scattering off the particle, they'd kick the particle around too much. So ultimately, you know, cryogenics is kind of an, uh, in some ways an attractive solution, but in many ways, an awfully painful one experimentally. And my second question is, uh, uh, do you think one day uh, your, um, this, your trap can be used as a dark matter detector, especially because uh, I am personally very much interested in uh, really uh, an instrument, an experiment, which be able to uh, detect dark matter by its gravitational uh, interaction. I don't know if you, if there is any possibility that your trap can be used one day for this, even if yeah. not now. Yeah, I think there is, and I think, so, I mean, I'd have to have someone who knows more about it really come up with some ideas of what we'd be looking for, um, because I, I haven't put that much thought into it. Um, I do think one of our advantages is the very low oscillation frequencies we have, mean that uh, we can get a significant response to, to relatively slow events. Now, I, what I don't have a good feeling of is, what kind of time scale we'd really be thinking about for, for dark matter interaction. Like, is this something that is uh, nanoseconds or microseconds or milliseconds or seconds uh, or longer that we have to think about? Or is it really just unknown? Or is it interesting to look at all time scales? I mean, this, this is just sort of the kind of thing that uh, if you had ideas and you said, no, no, if you look at, at slow time scales, like, uh, you know, on the order of a fraction of, of a second, like, milliseconds to seconds, if that's an interesting time range to look at, then, then it could be quite interesting in our trap, I'd say. Mm, it depends on the, I mean, time scale depends on the sensitivity of the, of the instrument and also the mass of the dark matter. Therefore, uh, higher sensitivity, you can 
extend it to longer longer distances than than longer times therefore right but yeah and, and but there's please, also I, I can i am not experimentalist therefore i don't yeah. uh, maybe i say things that uh, are not really relevant but uh, anyway yeah no I, I mean i think you know from a simple point of view our particles are really just uh, a three-dimensional harmonic oscillator um and it's not not so hard to figure out how they behave i in, in this case i i'd probably expect that the the classical detector is the way to go. Like it, it might be best to trap a fairly large particle uh, to maximize that gravitational attraction, unless you're looking at something that has to be on a, a very short, very small, small size scale. Uh, if it's a short distance kind of force, so it's not not like regular gravity. Um, uh, mostly, I would say like these bigger particles are probably the way to go. Okay, thanks. Hi, Brian. Yeah. So yeah, very thanks very much for the, the talk. It's a lot of covers, a lot of interesting ground. And I, I have quite a few questions, but maybe I'll ask you the most, the, the, the ones which are related to this, uh, the last bit, the, the silicon carbide uh, center. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, so it's it's spin measurement. So why why are you not doing um, say standard stern um for detecting the the spins and and using this uh, you know AC stern garlic is that more sensitive somehow? Or? Yeah. So the so the problem is if you try to do um, basically the the DC steady the the, the mm -hmm. time uh, not AC stern garlic but yeah the DC version. Um, mm -hmm. So then you have to measure the small displacement of the particle, right? And yeah. so the mm -hmm. problem with that is that. Uh, Often in these experiments, we hold the particle up with an electric field, uh, so mm -hmm. that especially in the for the larger particles, I didn't really talk about that, but we tend to hold them up with an electric field, and mm -hmm. now you become very sensitive to very small fluctuations in the electric field. So oh, now you have to sense. ask, can you hold your electric field stable enough to make this a resolvable change, and are all of your optics stable enough to do this? Whereas as soon as you get away from from DC, away from zero frequency. And up to some finite frequency, it helps experimentally a lot to avoid noise. So uh, now it also right, turns right. out, of course, that we have a harmonic oscillator. So if we can apply a force that's at the resonant frequency, then we get some resonant amplification of the motion. So okay. essentially, the yeah. AC version just increases the sensitivity. It makes it a lot easier to see. So with parameters right. we already get, we expect to be able to see this AC stern uh without a whole lot of trouble. And to do the spin right. resonance spectroscopy, you want to be able to detect the spin state as quickly as possible, right? With as little averaging as possible. Right, right, right. No, I, I understand. Okay, so so one of the one of the spin components will be excited quite a lot. The energy will be pumped in, while the other one not. Is, is that right? Um, well, so one of the mechanical degrees of freedom will get excited. Freedom, right? Yes. Right. For for readout. For, yes. for one of the for one of the spin states. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. For yeah. Okay, and and for the other spin state, it it won't because the the oscillator is in a different place. Or, or... well, so it's only going to be resonant with one degree of freedom, right, of the particle, and there's a gradient in the field only in one direction that's very strong. So, yeah. I I think those things together limit it to be, okay. you know, primarily uh, one one component that matters. I see. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. And and yeah, and... the yeah yeah tell, yeah. Continue. Yeah, I mean, this is just meant to be like a, a readout method, not like, you know, this is no, not I a, understand. this is not a single shot readout, but it's like, you know, it's a starting point to try to get an understanding of the, the ESR in the system. Right, 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 right. Now, of course, for readout, I mean, for in atomic physics, we integrate over a long time, a lot of photons, so I guess you are, you are kind of doing that kind of thing, right? Um, right. So, uh, one, one question I had is, regarding this um, uh, silicon carbide defect, since you mentioned that it is just a single missing uh, silicon uh, atom, right? Yeah. So so unlike the NV, now there is uh, no axis, right? The, the NV has these four axes, you know, along which the, so is it kind of, um, is it more spherically symmetrical in which way the spin can point? Yeah, so it turns out that because, of course, silicon carbide is a crystal, it, the silicon carbide still defines an axis for the defect. So it still does have sort of a preferred axis, but okay. there are not, there are not right. four different versions the way that there are in NV centers. There, it turns out there are two different versions in, uh, of silicon vacancy centers, but they're mm -hmm. at different energies. So you actually only use one of them at a time. So uh, unlike the NV where there are four that are degenerate, 
uh, in in silicon carbide, there's no uh, there, there's no such such thing that goes on. We really get to choose just just one, which is kind of nice. Okay, but there would still then be torques if if the if the um, if the magnetic field is not aligned with the, uh, that axis, right? That's that's right. So there are torques, and uh, so we either have to trap an elongated particle, or we have to get mm -hmm. get lucky in some way, right? As to to which way it's it's oriented. Right. Right. Okay. So, I mean, one of the nice things is you can buy big wafers of this stuff and mm. you know the orientation of the wafer and you can potentially make right. particles of the shape that you want. So all of that's much more plausible than in, in diamond. Okay. Thank you very much. Hmm? And your, um, your this, uh, the, the, what, what did you call the, the detection for the, this geophone, the geophone uh, detection? So is the detection mechanism it's like a pickup squid kind of thing, or or what is what is how does it sense acceleration? Oh, the commercial one. The, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the commercial device yeah. is is about as simple as you can imagine. It is a magnet, right, suspended mm -hmm. uh, on a spring in a coil of wire. So just the magnet moves up and down okay. and creates a changing oh, flux correct. in the coil. Yeah. No, it, it's super simple. I mean, but it's big. These have it says one kilogram test masses in it. Right. Uh, so it's right, just a right. big mechanical device and then you just detect that uh, induced EMF and amplify it and it's really sensitive. I see, I see, I see. So that alone cannot detect your uh, particles uh, position instead of optics. Um, it's not, not special resolution is not that good, is, is that? Right, we cannot use, you can't use the same technique because that's uses, so that's a commercial instrument. It has like, the masses are big, you know, they're like this size or something okay, okay. and they have big okay. coils. Okay. So, I mean, I think if you put a squid in our trap, you could probably detect the particles motion, but okay. uh, there's again, cryogenics, there's a large bias field. There's, there's a lot of challenges with that. So optics is nice because um, we can really control, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on pretty well with optics. I see, I see, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Brian, I have a question. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. What was the relative acceleration you can measure? You mentioned somewhere, but uh... Uh, let me flip back there so I can I can show you what we actually. Uh, there we go. So these are all actually calibrated. So this is uh, you can see this is like ten roughly ten to the minus seven uh, little g per root hertz. Um, so that is not, we're not really yet competitive with that commercial geophone. And we're certainly not yet competitive with, um, uh, with cold atoms or anything like that. Um, however, there is some hope that if you wanted to do a uh, particularly resonant uh, detection, so at very low frequencies down, down here on this plot, uh, that you can actually start to get competitive um, with, with some of these other, other techniques. So, um, I think there, there's room to imagine that we could do much better than this, I would say. Uh, we didn't really push this super hard. And have you thought about some kind of like dropping it? Maybe that would, that might, can you, can you do that in your laboratory? We can't right now because the fields are uh, permanent magnetic fields, right? Uh, we use permanent magnets, so we can't turn them off. Um, you'd have to tip the trap over or something like that. And, or, I mean, you, you, if, you, if you were really uh, wanted to be adventurous, you could probably fling it out the end of one trap and catch it in another and have it go in a little parabola. But I mean, such, such experiments don't tend to make students very happy because they take a lot of tries and you lose a lot of particles and they're just very time consuming. So, um, you know, my, my group is not that huge. I only have three graduate students right now. We have three experiments set up. Um, and uh, my postdoc recently left and got a real job at a local optics company in Bozeman, um, which I, I was happy for him because he has a kid and, and, and needed that. But, uh, you know, it, it, especially during the pandemic, we, we go for the low hanging fruit, right? Uh, do the easy experiments first. So I, all of those things I think are really cool. Um, and, and I'd love to try to do, you know, effectively free fall experiments, but uh, they, they're hard. You have to change your design as well, because now you're playing with the fixed magnet and then you, are, you have to, make it more uh, current carrying magnets or something like that, I guess. Right, right. But like I said, we could fling it out the end of the trap and have it go in a like a little, you know, a, a free trajectory for a little while and then catch it with another trap or something like that. So there are versions that are not yeah. just dropping it straight down, but are still, you know, still a projectile motion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I see. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So, so Brian, can I ask you one thing quick about the, you know, the, the formula you had for this minimum displacement, which was this yeah. uh, sum of uh, three terms in the square root, right? Yes. And they had yeah. one, one of them had even a T cube uh, term. So it doesn't look at all like standard quantum limit kind of thing, though you're like measuring uh, positions uh, at three times. Uh, so, uh, um, so is, is there a relation between that and the, like what we call the standard quantum limit? Yeah, so it should actually be pretty close. If you look at just the first two terms here, so the third one, yeah, that tau cubes, that's the time scale of the measurement cube, right? That's the thermal one. Um, so that, that's kind of a funny funny one that people don't usually include at all, but I wanted to, to include it in our analysis because we, we need it. Um, the, the first two, actually, if you if you take away a bunch of the, the the fudge factors mm -hmm. in here, the numerical parameters, it, it starts, it looks like the normal, the standard quantum one. There's some extra funny numbers like this three and four in the numerator uh, have to do with the three measurement sequence. So there's some extra factors that go in. And then I've included these uh, finite efficiencies. Those are the etas. And this FZ is, uh, because we don't have isotropic scattering, we have, uh, it's really me scattering. We have to include some factors that say, okay, well, the photons, when they scatter off, they don't scatter in all directions. They don't scatter just in the Z direction that we're measuring. They, me they scatter with some distribution. Uh, and we have to do a numerical calculation to, to determine um, pretty much all of those parameters. Other than those, it should look, uh, yeah, the tau squared in there in, in this second term is also a little funny, right? But that comes from this, uh, just from doing the measurement sequence. So it's it's not hard to connect those to the standard uh, I see. I see. I see. standard measurements. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a slightly tweaked version, really. Okay, thank you. And and last last but not the last question yeah. is that uh, I guess so. Why do you have these two masses on two sides with the spring in the middle? I mean, does that extra sensitivity when you have these two masses on two sides? Yeah. So. In that case, we're actually looking, so that's for measuring big G, right? And we're looking for a change in the spring constant that holds the trap. So because of that, we want to make a change in the potential and we'd like to make a symmetrical change in the potential, right? So it's parabolic, you'd like to kind of lower it or, or raise it. So if you, if you just put one, if you put one, the particle will displace to one side or the other. Um, but it turns out to, if you tried to do the measurement with the displacement, uh, if you think it through, you have to know more about the particle, you have to know something about either the spring constant or the mass of the particle or something like that. Whereas mm -hmm. for this frequency change, you only need to know K over M and that ratio you can get oh, from measuring the frequency. So it's, it's sort of a special measurement where you don't need to know mm -hmm. the details of the trapped particle. You only need to know its oscillation frequency. So it, it's sort of a, it, it's an elegant me uh, you know, measurement because of that. And this, it's called the time of frequency, uh, a time of swing method for measuring big G. And it has actually been used for measuring big G before with like a traditional, just a pendulum uh, kind of arrangement. Right. So uh, it works with, you know, big stuff too, not just little trap particles. And it, it is one of the standard techniques for measuring big G. I see. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much. I think that's, yeah, that's thank you. enough I, I had. Yeah, it was a very nice talk and, uh, yeah, if someone else has a question, otherwise maybe we can um, yeah, let Brian start his day, I guess. It's, it's very early morning. That's right, right? It's, it's early, yes. Yeah. That's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, yeah, let us catch up offline also some other time. Yes, so we absolutely. Just, uh, yeah, uh, watch this a few more, uh, one, few, one more time. And, uh, yeah. Sure, all right. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, okay. okay.